It's gonna be cool. <laughs> Not trying to be a couple of bogeys up here. <clears throat> hey there, folks. I am humbled to have a very special <laughs> guest in the kitchen here today. Something that took many years in the making. We finally got you here. The yeah. man who taught me how to cook. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating, Jake Kenji Lopez. All thank you so much for coming through. Good to see you. And look, we we realized the last time we were in the same room together was like 10 years ago. Yeah, I was trying to get an internship at Sirius, <laughs> <laughs> and I was coming off probably way too strong. I was like, guys, I'll work for free, 80 hours a week, <laughs> and they were probably like, well, I think things, things worked out okay for you. It worked out. Yeah, I just I I focused those energies, you know, not at strangers who were frightened of me. Instead, <laughs> just by myself in my basement, and eventually it got you down here. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You're here to talk to me both about your new cookbook, The Walk. Yeah, the Walk. <laughs> Why'd you write a book about a walk? Um, well, so <laughs> I was writing this book, um, yeah. and originally this book was going to be a two-volume box set, um, and uh, we ended up cutting about half of it because nobody was going to buy. Is that that big? Yeah, you oh. know, you got to keep it, you know, travel size, right? Yeah, Nine, exactly. <laughs> some odd pages. How many pages are you pulling here? Nine hundred and nine hundred fifty. Nine fifty-eight. Well, so we basically ended up taking everything that wasn't American or sort of American adjacent out of it, mm -hmm. um, and so one of the chapters was a chapter on the walk. Clearly, you were saving them for something. <laughs> well, saving some of them, but then you know, I started writing the book, and I real, you know, I started writing the second volume of the Food Lab, and this chapter uh, started just growing and growing, and I quickly sort of realized, like, you know what? There's enough about a walk to write another like food lab length book. You wrote a book about one piece of cookware that's bigger than my entire book about how to cook that I'm writing right now. <laughs> so, clearly, I'm here to learn from you today. I think we all know that. <laughs> because I've learned a lot from you, particularly that walks are versatile. You think of them as just stir fry machines as a white person. Uh, we're very confused by this, by this device and by the metal that it is made of. So I'm really excited not only to learn how to use it properly for the things that we obviously know it's supposed to be used for, like stir fries, but also learn some not so obvious uses for it. Mm -hmm. Because like you've mentioned, and the reason this book is so, so beautifully thick <laughs> and so well marbled is because it's so chock full Thank of you. information about such a versatile tool and I'm really excited to learn more. So, I was, I was aiming for, for thick and marbled. Normally, when I'm shooting stuff like this, right. I got Kendall over there doing the prep for me, and also uh, being somebody I can ask for knowledge. In this case, yeah. it's going to be the opposite. He does all the real work. <laughs> Where I'm going to just go chop vegetables, and y you're still going to be the knowledge over here. So you're going to have to do the double duty. But I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try to be your your assistant today over there. I'm going to do your mise. Thanks so much for coming. Awesome. Through, man. We'll see. You. We'll right. see. You in, I'll see you right now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Hello. Um, so the very the most important thing in a stir fry is the prep work that that takes by far the most time uh, and is the most important thing. The reason it's so important is because um, with stir fries, generally you're cutting your food into the shape uh, and size that you're going to be eating them, because um, people are going to be eating these with a chopstick, right? And so that means cutting into bite-sized pieces, and you also want to make sure that they're all cut in a way that they're going to cook at the right rate. Um, so what we're doing today is we're going to cook a pork and cucumber stir fry. Um, if you've never tried hot cucumber. It, uh, stir frying is a great way to try it. Um, so these porks are going to be cut into slivers. So I'm starting by first uh, taking pork loin and cutting it into sort of flat pieces like this. So the meat now I'm going to cut lengthwise into these thin slivers. Um, and this, this recipe, the recipe in this book, it calls just for marinating. Um, but I was thinking that I would also um, velvet the meat before cooking. What? Um, so we can show you the technique. But also just to show you that, you know, a lot of these things are really adaptable to your own personal taste. So if you prefer the texture of velveted meat, um, you can do that with virtually any recipe and the recipe is still gonna work as written. Kenji, what, what in the sweet good God is velveted meat? Oh, okay, so, <laughs> so velveting is a technique um, where you sort of par cook your meat and essentially what you do is you marinate it um, and the marinade will in include some uh, egg white as well as a starch, so egg white and cornstarch. And then you briefly simmer them uh, for like a second or two, or 10 seconds or so. Whether you're gonna velvet or not, and we'll get to that, the most important step when you are working with meat is to wash it. And I know there's all this stuff going on on the internet before about washing chicken and why you shouldn't wash your chicken. Um, it's true in Western recipes when you're working with big cuts of meat, you don't wash them. Uh, washing the meat for stir fries is what's going to give them that really tender texture. So I'm gonna take this over to the sink. Uh, oh, and I'm gonna grab first. So the way I'm doing this, like, I'm being really, really rough with it. I'm acting sort of like I'm wringing out clothes and I'm trying to squeeze out as much of the, um, the pigment and the sort of excess 
minerals and stuff on the inside, um, those are the things that are gonna, first of all, make it discolor. Um, but by squeezing it like this, you're also loosening up the muscle fibers um, so that they are, A, more easily able to um, pick up marinade and flavors, and B, come out a lot more tender. So you can see, I can bring this back, but the last thing I was doing is I'm really trying to get as much moisture as possible. Um, so I have it in a strainer, and you can see all this stuff that comes out of it. But like really squeezing it like I'm, like I'm bringing out the laundry. Yeah. And then you're left with this pork that has been, you know, it, it, you've gotten pigment out of it, you've gotten fluids out of it, and you're left with pink lemonade, which is a nice... Yeah, pink, pink, nice pink slime, right? <laughs> that looks delicious. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. This is the um, last of our Shushing cooking wine, if okay, I'm saying cool, that correctly. Cool. These are some pickled jalapenos that I made. That's, That's the only pickled chilies we have. Great, that'll work. Uh, the, this sesame oil, this is an egg. Is there a sugar? The uh, sugar's there. Oh, sugar. All right, so now we're gonna marinate our pork. Um, I'm gonna start with the very basic marinade. So we're gonna do a little bit of sugar, about a half teaspoon of sugar. This is for a pound of meat. Quarter teaspoon of white pepper. A teaspoon of soy sauce. This is light soy sauce. Chinese light soy sauce, that's L-I-G-H-T, not L-I-T-E. Um, there are two types of light soy sauce. So L-I-G-H-T is regular Chinese light soy sauce. And, and uh, it uh, separates it from dark soy sauce, which is sort of sweeter and darker in color. Um, L-I-T-E soy sauce is low sodium soy sauce, um, and that's a very different product. So what you're looking for is Chinese style light soy sauce. Um, and if you can't find that, you can always use Japanese style shoyu, like kikoman, something like that is fine. Some soy sauce and about a teaspoon of toasted sesame oil and a teaspoon of shaoxing wine. Um, if you can't find shaoxing wine, you can use dry sherry, dry vermouth, something like that. Um, now the last ingredient I'm gonna add right here is some uh, baking soda. So this is about a quarter teaspoon of baking soda. Um, now baking soda is kind of the other secret ingredient when it comes to really getting that super tender, almost slick texture in stir-fried meats. Um, the alkalinity of baking soda uh, is what um, keeps muscle proteins from binding too tightly so that you're, uh, you don't squeeze out excess moisture. Um, and your meat stays more tender as it cooks. I'm actually also gonna add, because we're going to be velveting, I'm also gonna add a egg white. Um, so an egg white is also alkaline, um, so it will also enhance that sort of tenderizing effect. Uh, in the case of velveting, what it's also gonna do is it's going to combine with the cornstarch we're gonna add um, and form a sort of coating, about a teaspoon of cornstarch, on the surface of the meat. And this one I'm just gonna get right in with my hands. What we're gonna do is we're gonna very briefly blanch this in water um, and it forms a sort of very thin, uh, thin sort of slick coating on the surface that first of all, it helps retain more, any moisture that's coming out of the pork, it'll help retain it so it stays juicier, um, but it'll also allow sauces and stuff to adhere. Um, it also makes the stir frying process much briefer, so if you have a relatively weak stove top or if you're working with um, electric or induction um, and can't get that really big flame, velveting it before you stir fry will allow you to make sure that it's fully cooked um, before it goes into the pan and so you won't get that problem where it starts to like exude moisture and bubble and steam instead of really fry. All right, so this is what we're looking for. Now you could set this aside for, you know, in the fridge overnight and it will, the marinade will go in deeper, it'll get more tender and more juicy. Um, we're just gonna set it aside while we prep the remaining ingredients and it's still gonna come out fine. All right, so now we have our meat marinated. Um, we're gonna be velveting that in a second, so now we're gonna get our other ingredients going. So I'm gonna start with the sauce. This recipe is a very, very simple sauce, so it's about one and a half tablespoons of light soy sauce one and a half tablespoons of water. If you had it, you could also use chicken stock. Andrew, you have chicken stock? Yeah, I got chicken stock. I, I already poured the water in, so it doesn't matter. Actually, you know, I made some really gorgeous shrimp stock if you're interested oh, yeah? in that. I don't know if that's helpful. Sure. Helpful. Do you have more, more soy sauce? Yeah, let's use your, oh, let's use your shrimp, shrimp stock. Hide, hide shellfish in dishes where you don't expect it. So we're doing a very simple sauce of shrimp stock. If you don't have shrimp stock at home, you can ask Andrew to make it for you. So about a tablespoon and a half of shrimp stock and an equal amount of soy sauce. And then a teeny bit of white pepper again. All right, so we got our sauce. Um, we're gonna make a little cornstarch slurry, um, and this is what we're gonna use to thicken up the dish at the end and make sure that the sauce is adhering to the meat. Um, so we're gonna do about a tablespoon of water and a teaspoon of cornstarch. So one of the things I did in my book um, for any of the stir-fry recipes was I, before you start, I have this like list of all the different bowls that you should have. Um, and all, including all the empty bowls, all the empty plates, all the things that every single thing you should have 
by your station before you start stir frying because that is the most important step in stir frying is being sure that you got everything ready before you go. So let's see, I've got my marinated pork. I'm gonna finish, blend I'm gonna finish uh, velveting that. Ginger, garlic, and chilies. I love cutting garlic. Um, I really like doing this, which is when you have a nice flat um, Chinese style cleaver like this is just whacking the garlic. So you whack it firm and then you give it a little slide. That way the garlic doesn't go flying everywhere. Um, all right, and our ginger, this is just, we're just gonna be slicing these. So these are actually gonna end up sort of as whole slices in the dish. This is some very young ginger, so the, the skin is nice and soft, tender, so you don't have to peel it. So you can do it exactly the same with this garlic. Um, you cut it into a coin and then you just give it a little smash and you can see it's basically minced itself already. You just kinda gotta break it up a little bit. Garlic, ginger, and pickled chilies in a bowl. Um, the recipe calls for these Thai-style pickled pickled chickled pillies. <laughs> pickled lilies, um, pickled chilies. Um, what we're using today is these uh, pickled jalapenos that Andrew did himself. All right, so we're moving a cucumber now. I'm gonna get the seeds out. When you're prepping vegetables, especially for stir fries, you want to get rid of any of the sort of really watery bits. Um, so particularly for cucumber, you know, sometimes you want to take these out just for the sake of presentation or concentrating flavor or whatever. Um, with the stir fry, it's really essential because the seeds have a ton of water um, and water is sort of the enemy of, of high heat. All the energy that it takes to take a drop of water from zero degrees to 100 degrees Celsius, so from freezing to boiling, uh, it takes five times more energy to take it from there to evaporating. Um, so any kind of excess liquid that's in your pan uh, is gonna really rapidly drop the heat. Then we're gonna Cut them into kind of quarter inch-ish slices. Okay, so the recipe calls for putting the cucumbers and the scallions in one bowl, because those are going to go into the wok at the same time. So I'm cutting these scallions into a sort of one inch segments here. All right, so we got our sauce, we got our pork, we got our cornstarch slurry, we got our cucumbers and scallions, we got our garlic, ginger, and pickled chilies. All right, so this is where I'm gonna start the, um, the velveting process. So this is our meat that's been marinated. Um, remember it has egg whites and cornstarch in the marinade. Uh, egg whites, baking soda and cornstarch in the marinade along with a few other things. Um, but those egg whites and the cornstarch are the important part when we're talking about velveting. Um, so I've got a wok full of simmering water here. I'm basically just gonna put the meat in, break it up with some chopsticks. The idea is that you want everything to be in individual pieces. Um, and because we had that sesame oil in there, that's gonna actually help it separate quite easily. So you shouldn't have like a big clump of meat. And this only takes about 20 seconds or so, 10 to 20 seconds, um, and we're done. That's it. So here I'm gonna pick them up, transfer them onto a tray. And the idea, when we put them on this tray, we wanna spread it out. Um, and the idea is that they're gonna steam dry while we get everything else ready. And so by the time we're ready to stir fry, the pork will be Nice and dry. So this is being velveted here. This is, yes, so this has already been velveted. So we, um, you, it would be, be what's called passing through. So essentially we just pass it through the hot liquid. Just like in life. Yep. Okay, so we are ready to cook. So I'm gonna have my ingredients here in the order that I'm going to be adding them to the pan. Um, so I'm using chicken fat to cook with, but any kind of oil will, will work. The recipe in the book calls for stir frying the pork raw first in a couple of batches. Um, because we're doing this velveting process, we don't have to do that step. So it's already cooked. So now we're gonna cook the other ingredients and then add the pork back in at the end. So, so when, you're, when you're cooking in a wok, you wanna always heat it over high heat like this, um, just until it starts to smoke. I mean, you're basically just using that as a temperature gauge. So once it starts smoking, you know you're at like, you know, 500 plus degrees or so. And then depending on what you're cooking, you're gonna lower the temperature. I'm gonna lower this down just a little bit. Some recipes will lower it a lot, but you lower it, you add your fat, You swirl it in, Woo! and then you want to basically immediately start cooking. So I've got my aromatics going in. Those are just to infuse the oil with flavor. That's going to take about 15 seconds. And then I have my vegetables going in. So that's my cucumbers, my scallions here. So you can see it's a, yeah, it's a toss fry. And I do drop some things sometimes. You gotta, you gotta be comfortable with dropping the some dog things. Pork. Yeah. And now my meat is gonna go right back in. Mm. 
And then finally, my sauce is gonna go in. And when I add my sauce, um, what I'm gonna do is add it around. So there's a couple ways you can do it, right? You could pour it right over the center, um, or you can pour it around the edges. And when you pour it over the center, what happens is it basically stays raw. It kind of trickles down slowly and it reduces slowly. Whereas if you pour it around the sides, it hits that hot metal first. And you're sort of searing it and you develop these, these different flavors. Then, uh, so you want, yeah, you want to hear that sizzle when you add your sauce. It's almost as if the pan is a steel drum when you're using different parts of it to make different Different effects, exactly. Effects. All right, so now we're just gonna add about half of our cornstarch slurry to start. And this is just to thicken it up to the right texture. Um, so what I'm looking for is for it to basically just coat the uh, ingredients in a sort of glossy sheen. So that, to me, that still looks a little bit, like there's a little bit too much sauce, I'll let it reduce slightly, and then I'll also add a little bit more thickener to it. All right, so that's the level of sauce I'm looking for, um, where I pull, my, I pull my spatula forward, and a little trickle comes down, but it's not like swimming in it. cucumbers, right? I love hot cucumbers. I never, mm. you think like, ugh, hot cucumbers, but <laughs> then you're like, ooh, hot cucumbers. Yeah, and especially when you cook them, like stir fry them like that, they stay crunchy mm. in the middle, but they pick up just a little bit of that, that kind of shiny flavor on the outside. Something that's so hard to get over when you're a new cook is like a lot of flavor, not all flavor, but a lot of flavor comes from blasting stuff with heat. Yeah. You can only do that if you properly meast. Right. You need everything chopped, you need everything in a bowl ready to dump, Otherwise, it's gonna burn by the time you. I mean, get it yeah, over. like with my my garlic and and chilies and, and uh, ginger at the beginning, like even in like the ten seconds I was talking, you could see it starting to turn just a little. Like if I had left it there for literally three seconds longer, it would have been burnt. So everything you you are incapable of making this dish unless everything is ready to go in that pan by the time the heat yeah. kisses. Yeah. You don't want to have to move from your. You, you want your hand to always be on here. Yeah. Like within hands reach. This is what you want, folks. You're cooking at home for any recipe virtually as long as you're starting yeah. out. Get everything looking like this. Yeah. You're ready to measure that. Speaking of which, rock out with your walkout. I want to eat. <laughs>